Uh, let me introduce our next speaker. Thanks, <laughs> Randy McIntosh, one of the most intelligent. <laughs> sometimes. 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 Um, so I just I've joined us a few this year, as I mentioned earlier, um, in the Institute of Neuroscience and Technology, also the Department of Physiology and Kinesiology. I was in Toronto for 25 odd years at um, Baycrest Centre at the Robin Research Institute, and my uh, area of focus has been uh, cognitive and cognitive neuroscience. Um, it's, uh, it's interesting how Sam and I didn't actually coordinate our talks. So, but it's nice to see that there's there's good overlap between what we presented. Um, you, go, you hear some redundancy, but there's also some differences in terms of how we um, contextualize the different kinds of approaches that uh, we will hear about over the next um, next day and a half. The talk, um, the title of the talk is kind of cheeky, and it's actually meant um, it's, it's somewhat we can call it an insult, but a little bit of a poke. Uh, to what often happens in computational approaches to um, or neuroscience in general, where you just sort of press a button and don't really care about what's underneath in the software. And often you can go wrong if you actually don't really understand at least the conceptual um, implications of using one method versus another method for doing the data analysis. Um, so yeah, you should probably pay attention to the equation a little bit, at least understand what the implications are. Um, because if it's misused, then you can actually go down the wrong path very quickly. Ah, okay. I'll do it this way. So um, Sam covered um, this part quite well as the in picture, but I just want to reiterate that um, a lot of what happens in how we measure brain dynamics tends to pull the system into the key. Um, so we tend to focus on things like the anatomy, the number of ways you can measure it. You measure the anatomy in terms of volumes. You can also measure the anatomy in terms of connections. Um, you can get down to very detailed connections like this diagram on the left, which is the classic Feldman Van Essen wiring diagram for the primate um, visual system. Um, and, or you can do diffusion tensor imaging. And that provides you with sort of the, the enabling conditions, if you will, that show how areas could communicate, essentially the pipes or the wires. Whereas in some respects, the, the dynamics that you measure with fMRI, with MEG, EG, with intracranial measures, even with calcium imaging, optical imaging, are telling you what actually is communicating. Um, these okay. dancing thing is not very well, but anyway, we'll continue to put it. The one thing that you do miss by focusing on a, on a single way of measuring this system is that you tend to miss the fact that the system has this multi-scale organization, uh, multiple scales across space. So we've got, you know, the, again, the fMRI EEG measures over on the left. Um, you have the mesoscale levels, which could be think, thought of things like local field potentials or calcium imaging, we're actually looking at uh, circuits. Um, and you can get down to the micro scale. Um, and each of these scales um, have different time scales as well, going everything from seconds to half seconds, all the way down to the several microseconds, even sub microsecond um, levels. And that adds a level of complexity to the whole picture. And I wanted to throw this up just to scare the hell out of you. Um, because this is, this is actually how the system is, for, is, is organized. In a, in a uh, both a conceptual as well as an actual framework. So um, this slide um, is borrowed from the uh, um, Marshall Clemens of the New England Complex Systems Institute. And this is made to make the point that the brain is a complex system, complex adaptive system to be precise. Adaptive in the sense that it's constantly trying to change how it does things to respond to a given situation. Um, and that, capacity to change is persistent um, across the entire lifespan of the brain being used. But it is there all the time. So what that means is that the complex system will have this necessity to explore. This necessity to explore is embodied in the architecture, the architecture being, for example, networks, 
So the networks at different levels that provide the conduits to allow the system to interact and support and test different configurations and see if that configuration is appropriate for a given situ uh, situation. There's a number of scales in which it exists that interact dynamically to give rise to a number of components where the emergent behavior um, is how that system acts in, in concert to enable behavior that could be adaptive for a given situation. Um, and there were terms that Victor threw around like chaos and so on, a way to characterize the behaviors of these systems. But the notion here is that it is a system that has a number of layers to it. And the goal of the modeling efforts to try and find ways to combine at least components of this complicated mess in a way that we can better understand it. So, and the way to do that is with modeling. You can't measure all those different levels. It, it is impossible. Um, and I give an example of modeling in aeronautics because it, to me, it's a really salient example. It's not necessarily a complex adaptive system, it's certainly a complex system. <clears throat> modeling in aeronautics really accelerated the whole industry of aeronautics dramatically. Um, things being able to model the effects of different kinds of wing designs, be able to model different kinds of fuselage designs, modeling how um, the air flows across the wing um, in the sense of turbulence. Um, and this accelerated the design of aircraft and then the adoption of aircraft. Um, and now you can sit in an aircraft and don't even know you're flying. You're actually sitting in a, a sea somewhere, usually, unless you're coming into Vancouver during the storm. Or I guess it's coast as well sometimes. Um, and this approach can be applied to, to the brain to understand brain dynamics. And Victor gives some great examples. In his talk, I'll touch upon those again. Um, but the idea here is that now let's take these different things we've measured and try and put them together somehow by using some modern techniques to look at dynamics, put them into phase space, and understand how these different elements can put together um, you know, to instantiate um, behavior and knowledge, and how they might change in the face of damage. We get back to this, and we've, we've now talked about taking the system apart and trying to measure different aspects of that system and finding ways to pull it back together. I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the same things that Sam talked about in terms of how these metrics are used, um, but let's talk about it in a totally different perspective. So um, you'll often see connectivity um, in networks in general discussed in a, in a number of different ways um, in the brain. Um, and actually, another system that have network properties. I think we talk about connections between the structural part of it, the functional part of it, and the effective part of that. Well, structural, as we already know, that's actually measuring essentially the wires. The function is measuring what elements of the system are actually are potentially talking together, or at least showing similar patterns of activity. The effective is asking a question about which nodes are affecting which nodes directly, what are influences. Reporting is a causal. Of the system. There's a progression of how that might work. So again, in brain, structural indicates the axonal aspects um, of those. Um, there is a directional inference put in place. Functional, again, is statistical dependencies, and effective is to require some sort of model to understand um, how they can influence one another. Let's talk about structural first. I take this uh, quote from Giulio Tononi. Um, he made this statement in Green Connectivity Workshop a few years back. Anatomy is destiny. Uh, I'll let you just let that sink in. Yeah. <laughs> um, Sam mentioned um, graph theory. I'll talk about that in a second. Um, it's very interesting to look at the, the evolution of how people looked at anatomy in the brain, particularly when it became easier to access uh, databases that had information about connections and large circuits. And um, this paper from Malcolm Young uh, was published a long time ago. It's probably one of the most um, influential in the sense of looking at, oh, geez, we can actually do more with an additive than just sort of look at this connections. So we can actually look at a geometrical configuration of how these connections um, can be expressed in terms of things like distance. Do they have any any um, insights in terms of how function might be instantiated 
So he just took basically the connection matrix I showed you earlier, put it into a binarized, what's called an adjacency matrix, basically just the uh, square matrix that has ones and zeros, where things are connected and where they're not, and ran multidimensional scaling. Um, so it's essentially like a de uh, decomposition technique. I looked at the, the, the geometry of that decomposition and found this. This uh, circular um, array uh, looks very much like the dorsal and ventral streams in the prime individual system. Um, dorsal going through here, ventral going through here. And that came out of the anatomy with no function imposed. Um, so it was a nice uh, indication that maybe there is something to look at uh, a well structure more than just saying that A and B are connected, but it looks like the entire matrix. And that led a number of individuals, including uh, my close colleague, now deceased, Rolf Potter, um, to take a, a deeper dive to actually look at more of the information, things like degree of connectivity. Um, um, he and uh, Clark Stefan looked at things like network participation in disease, which was a way of characterizing how important he quotes different areas were based solely on anatomical connections. And not to understand the capacity, again, for these systems to integrate information, and which nodes were more important or different if that down here, other nodes in terms of things like symmetry of connections and the capacity to transmit information in a, in a directed manner. Um, graph theory goes way back. Um, it wasn't developed for brain, it was actually developed for many other things long before neuroscience came along. Um, uh, lots of strogats uh, sort of popularized some of the, the, the ideas around uh, graph theory, particularly having to do with um, complex systems and uh, noting this idea of small world networks and the capacity of these networks to integrate um, information showing that complex networks which have small world arch architecture have a higher capacity to integrate information in systems that have either a regular connectivity pattern or completely random. Um, so that, again, led to an explosion of applications of graph theory. Uh, I'm not going to go through this uh, stamp sub covered it a little bit, um, but there are terms that are used to describe um, the properties of graphs now that are uh, quite, quite common in the, in, the, in the imaging literature now. Um, uh, Olaf Horns, who we'll be talking this afternoon, Giulio Tononio, I mentioned earlier, and Rolf Cotter, um, it was probably one of the most pivotal papers in the um, whole business of looking at connections in the brain. As a matter of fact, this is what led to the whole revolution in my mind for the, for the connectome project that uh, came from that. It succeeded in the connectome project by several years. Um, but it's proposed that if we look at connections, as a whole, we may be able to understand a bit more about the, about the capacity to process information. Um, and that, again, led to this revolution. There was some great work from Patrick Hagman, um, which is now called the Hagman data set, which has, like, I think, five individuals that are very um, uh, highly measured with DTI. Just looking at the connection capacity, this is cancer imaging, and doing that identify parts of the brain that seem to be different in terms of their connection patterns and other parts of the brain, identifying what's called the core um, areas that are really, really highly connected um, with other parts of the brain and seem to be sending out information to all the parts, of the brain, suggesting there's some sort of priority there. Um, and the, that these regions, particularly the posterior cuneus, um, seem to be quite consistent um, across individuals. But um, a part about that is that they found that structure and function, um, while correlated highly, are not perfectly correlated. Um, which, uh, for reasons that are not really clear to me, surprised some people. But other people were not surprised because, again, function and structure are correlated but not deterministic. So there are things that function provides you because the structure provides you the playground. It doesn't tend to go play here. You can play here as well. So it's enabling but not necessarily completely deterministic. So, um, I'll, I'm going to pause just very quickly just to show you these slides. I'm just saying that DTI is not a perfect measure of anatomy. Most of you probably know that, but it's worth just re reiterating that it's not really measuring direct connections of axons, it's measuring the architecture of axons, which is what sound said earlier. 
let's jump on to function now. Um, so functional connectivity, um, if you look back in the literature, actually was introduced by Walter Penfield and colleagues in 1963. Actually earlier, because Penfield, when he was making his notes um, about what was happening in the brain, coined this term functional connections um, of, of different ensembles. Um, because he couldn't measure anatomy, he just assumed that there was some that ability for different ensembles to communicate. He called that name functionally connected. So those of you think it was Barry Horowitz or Carl Friston, it wasn't. It was actually only from Canada. Woo. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, the methods have been around quite a while. Uh, Barry Horowitz um, uh, did introduce the idea of looking at functional connections uh, quite a while ago, 1984. And, that, and even looking at them in a recording called resting state. So resting state functional connections were basically introduced in 1984 um, with Barry. Uh, there were some extensions from there. Carl Kristen um, introduced an extension called psychophysiological interactions, which looked at task dependent changes in functional connections. Um, and sometimes if you apply these measures, just looking at what, what, what are the statistical dependencies, you might get enough information from there to make some sort of inferences about the capacity of the system, at least getting close to that. Um, there, uh, as, as uh, Sam mentioned, there was an explosion of um, lo looking at resting state of functional connections with fMRI. Um, this is a slide that looks at, we looked at Barat Biswal, who was the first person to coin the term, or at least look at this in the motor cortex um, in, in, in bold uh, MRI. It's looking at what we call resting state or spontaneous um, connections through the fluctuations in bulk. Um, and this has been now going on um, since 1995, so it's been around for, for a long time as well. And um, from there, through, through a number of papers, as, as Sam mentioned, that there has been now um, labeling of these patterns of functional connections in terms of putative um, brain functions, representing some aspect of brain function um, themselves. Um, and one of the ones that's been the most popular course is the default mode network. And this is a paper from uh, Michael Fox and Mark Brickle, um, which uh, talked about these uh, areas being connected and having some sort of task positive and task negative areas, which Sam mentioned as well. Um, there has been different techniques now applied to make this whole exercise easier, having to do going from voxel-wise connections or element-wise connections to patterns um, using things like principal components analysis or more recently probably more popular, um, which is uh, similar to PCA, but doesn't have the same assumptions about how the dimensions um, are related. Um, it is excellent for artifact rejection as well. So you have artifacts, I see it's worth longer. Um, but it just so happens that looking at these resting state networks with ICA does produce some fairly robust and reasonable result. Uh, work from Jeska Penwasok, who's now in uh, Wayne State, I think, um, looking at a number of individuals and showing that this pattern can replicate quite nicely um, across, I think it's about 100, which is from 100 healthy controls for the state. So, um, Across a long stretch of time, which is typically how resting state functional connections are computed, you get these, these stable patterns. But Victor and Sam mentioned that if you look at small windows, you do find that these patterns of connections, these networks, do switch allegiances. So there are switches of which nodes are talking to one another at any point in time. And you see that in the, in the dynamics of functional connectivity. Um, there have been several papers that showed that these um, functional connections will change. Um, they, they change their allegiances uh, off time. This is the, from the Allen paper that was one of the seminal ones there. And this is just showing you that sliding window um, approach that you saw in a couple of examples um, that were mentioned earlier, where the affiliation of functional connections across time shifts um, at an individual level as well. So just that there are individual differences in how the brain, if you will, traverses this repertoire across space and across time. Um, and we do not have a good handle on what those differences mean to us. Um, 
There has been some attempts to look at that. This is an excellent paper from Joanna Cabral um, using a technique called LIDA. It's a decomposition technique that takes the spatial patterns, looks at the temporal tendency, and also the likelihood of switching between different states. There's a complementary method called hidden Markov models, which um, Sarah can tell you all about. If you, some, if you give her some skill, it's nice to you. <laughs> This is a technique where you look at, again, the, the interactions between networks and like the transitions in between states. And in this particular paper, we found that um, older adults who um, had higher cognitive status showed one particular pattern of transitions indicated in green, whereas those who had poor cognitive status show a different pattern of transitions indicated in black. So this is again suggesting that there is some functional consequence in terms of your actual behavior, cognitive consequence of how you transition across space and time. Um, let's now jump into effective connectivity. So again, functional connectivity is just telling you that areas are showing some statistical dependency um, across time, whether that's correlation, covariance, mutual information, coherence, it's not directed. It just tells you that they're statistically related. Effective connectivity is an attempt to infer directionality. Um, a long time ago, I introduced the adoption of a technique called structure equation modeling to, um, to neuroscience. And there, what um, we did was use the anatomy to impart the potential causal interactions and use the function to add weights to the um, connections. So the arrows, the direction of the arrows comes from the anatomy, but the weights, the numerical weights for those arrows come from the function. So you decompose things like the functional connectivity matrix. And by decomposing that in the context of the anatomy, you add a weight to the, to the connections directly. Now you can say that in this network, there's a strong influence of going from A to B, but B is not doing anything. Um, and that was uh, work we did in rats, work we did in humans, or extensions um, more recently. Um, some work done by Anna Salip, who's now in Dallas, um, looking at um, the progression of spinal cerebellar ataxia and the change of the interactions between the cerebellar system and the cortex um, as people move from pre symptomatic um, to kind of very severe spinal cerebellar ataxia. The changes in the effective connections and the causal influences in these areas. Um, and suggesting that the patterns here right, may be predictive of progression. And if they have any kind of way to intervene, there might be an opportunity to try and preserve some connections through some sort of interventions. Uh, DCM, dynamic causal modeling, is another technique looking at effective connections. It was introduced by Carl Kristen um, in 2003. Um, and this is going to get us a bit more into the direction that Victor talked about in terms of being pulling things together. Um, the question earlier about trying to, to link different uh, domains. Um, here, um, the idea is to try and use um, inferences based on the neuronal activity and how that neural activity produces or generates what you see um, empirically. So it uses parameters of neural level to simulate bold activity and then take that simulated bold activity and fit it to the model. Um, I'm going to skip that equation, that part there. That's an equation, which is behind the curtain, so just pay no attention to it. <laughs> um, DCM has been used to do some hypothesis testing, um, some very nice work done very early on by Andrea and Kelly. Um, with, with Cassie Price, with Tim O'Penny, and Carl Kristen, looking at um, whether or not uh, the specialization um, that you see in the visual system, the visual cortical visual system, is explained from top down or bottom up influences in a, in a causal model. But what they found was actually the specialization um, of responses in the network actually came from bottom up influences rather than top down um, in the cortical visual system, which is rather surprising given what you might think should happen. But it was a nice example of testing hypotheses using effective activity modeling. Um, that whole approach has been extended now to make it much more 
um, detailed in terms of the, the architecture of the generative model. Um, Rosalind Moran's been the primary person who's driven that. She's actually now modeling um, individual cells as well as cell layers and using that as a generative model to, to, to make connections um, to local field potential work as well as EGP and MEG. Um, so it's a nice uh, example of, of pulling together what you think you know about the brain, putting that in a model, and then using the empirical data to test um, how well that model is actually working. Um, Granger causality is another way of doing activity measure. That's basically a technique looking at time series um, uh, integration. I'm not going to go through it in too much detail. Um, I'll, only just to say that this has, it was originally introduced in economics actually. It just looks at how well um, you can predict a time series from, from a particular source based on information from other time series. So I have time series X and I look at its autocorrelation, so how it predicts itself in the future. And then I have time series Y. If I add time series Y to the prediction, does Y give you more information about what's going to do in the future? So does Y add to the prediction of X? And if it does, that suggests that there's actually some potential causal relationship between X and Y. And that can be expanded into multivariate domains as well. Um, and it has been used nicely. It can be used as LFP data, EEG data, MEG data, as well as fMRI um, very easily, as well as spectral. I want to pause here because this is an important um, idea. This kind of gets back to some of the discussion that Victor brought forward, as well as some of the points that I was trying to make in terms of how one approaches this idea of trying to derive some insights from um, from uh, neuroimaging data or neurophysiological data. Um, there are two approaches. They're not necessarily dichotomous, so don't, don't take this as an either or prospect. It's more of a continuum, actually. But for the purposes of the discussion, let's talk about it as if it is a dichotomy. Um, so we have what are called predictive models over here. We have generative models. Generative model says I'm going to put in some sort of machinery or architecture in this model called that will generate some sort of data, empirical data. It can generate, for example, in the case of virtual brain, we can have it generate um, fMRI data, we can have it generate EEG data, we can have it generate real potential. Same model. And the question is, does it do well? Predict the data well. The other um, approach is to have a bunch of data and see we're trying to infer some sort of underlying process from that. That can be done using PCA, ISA, and so on. So I measure fMRI, um, structural MRI, and another measure could be um, MRS or ASL, for example, and say we're going to use all these different data to infer something. And usually that's inferring um, things like group membership, for example, controls versus gradations, or trying to explain some gradation across cognitive function. It's a prediction framework. This is hugely popular in machine learning, as you might have thought by now. So we have tons of data that we've collected across tons of individuals, and we have very sophisticated algorithms that can pull these data together and generate predictive models. Um, machine learning to predict, for example, again, um, patients versus controls, and subtypes of different patient populations, and so on. Um, they will help us with. Um, deriving the most important indicators for that prediction. The important thing here is, however, it's really difficult to make any kind of causal or mechanistic inference on the design. Because you just derive the data. So there's actually no model that derives that tells you how this data came about. Um, I give a good example, and I will apologize again to my colleagues in computer science. Um, that in some of the early applications that we work with, some computer scientists on machine learning, we gave them great um, imaging data to differentiate between um, uh, different age groups. And they came back with a fabulous predictive model. And I said, well, what was the actual, like, what are the, what is the, are the X variables that are deriving? What are the indicators that are deriving? So I don't know, we just put it in the machine learning model. You know, it's a great thing. Well, what was it? It was actually head motion. 
it's no, but not really helpful in terms of understanding healthy aging. Um, so those are the challenges, but not actually knowing the equation behind the curve. Um, the generative model, of course, uh, does have the capacity to, to give um, causal inferences, um, but it does need to be assessed in terms of model fit. And it's just a model, it's not reality. It will have its own problems in each itself. The model will improve over time, but it's ultimately still a model. Um, and the example of this generative approach, Hector talked about it quite a bit, so I'm not going to go into great details, but this is one way of approaching this. You'd be able to take different data sets, um, structural data for geometry, DTI data for the, the pipelines, the wires again, pulling them together. You can now have your generative model, um, which would be a sort of a neural mass uh, approximation, which could be an oscillator, it could be an epileptor, it could be a biophysical model that has different cell populations um, in the model. Um, when you pull those together um, in a dynamic metro model that has these connections, you can stimulate it in the node level, you can stimulate it from the scalp, and then generate empirical data that you would then compare to the actual data and say, how close did my model fit the data? And you can do that as a cycle and keep on optimizing your parameters until the fit index leads to some asymptotic level. And you say, this is the best I can do um, given my particular model. Now, this is like actually a good point where you get some indications of how good my model, model really is. Is uh, first of all, how close, how good is the fit? How good is the relative fit? And can I predict anything from this data? Does it tell me anything new, for example, about the nature of what I'm trying to model? And then it does the, the, and does it actually predict something in the future? Does it predict, for example, the success of uh, intervention, um, surgical intervention? And that's the epileptor um, criteria. Does it, this is the package, these are the criminals who invented this package. <laughs> Vector is in Berlin, Vector is not in Berlin right now, either one. Um, and we have applied it to different, different approaches. Um, this is an example, um, sort of a combination of some early work um, done by a lot of us, just showing you how you can integrate data from the um, cortical um, structural MRI. You can get reaches of interest. You can put them into ROIs, um, identify their centers. Using DTI, you can then look at the connectivity between these things, at least putative connectivity, and then um, put on some virtual EEG caps and then generate dynamics. And using those dynamics, you can generate EEG data, what that will look like across the um, simulated scalp. You can generate also um, fMRI bold uh, data, which we'll come up in a second. Um, and also, um, using this the same model, you generate the local field potentials. So the idea is it's not three different models or three different kinds of data. It's the same model um, all the way through. So it wants me to speed it up. That's the way. So just, it's, you're out of time, right? You can, okay, moving. Um, you do the data fitting um, with your data features, and you find out what the critical features are to generate intrinsic activity um, in, in the system. So, for example, using these models, we, we were able to show that noise that's in your brain is quite important for generating these intrinsic patterns. They're, they're deterministic because there's an anatomical basis, but the way you navigate through this deterministic architecture is enabled by brain noise. If the brain noise goes away, you don't explore as well. If the brain noise changes, you might get stuck, for example, in particular doctor's space. We extended this to aging and dementia. There's a nice example from a work from Joel Zimmerman, who was in, was in my lab. I was in, in uh, California uh, working for a biotech company. Um, but using this model, we're able to, to differentiate between uh, not just persons with Alzheimer's and healthy controls, but also different streams or continuum of people with MCI, mild cognitive impairment. And the, the idea would be that the MCI patients were closer to the dementia patients, those who actually do have a uh, clinical diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease. Those MCI patients may actually be the ones that are going to transition to dementia, Alzheimer's dementia, whereas the other ones may have a different kind of dementia disease or nothing, not really dementia at all. So that's what you see in the view here. There are MCI patients whose um, biophysical parameters in their model is that they're more like controls than other groups. 
Um, this is another example of what's called virtual um, pharmacotherapy, where you model the effects of memantine um, on uh, an Alzheimer's brain. You show that by giving memantine, at least in this particular model, which you change the spectral power in the dementia model from having there is a slowing, which Sam talked about, to actually changing the spectral power so that they're reestablished back to what you see in healthy controls. So it's an example of virtual pharmacotherapy. Um, so, to, to finish up, a couple of cautionary scenarios. And this, this, a version of this actually was in Sam's talk, more in terms of how you measure this. But this is just giving you, reinforcing the fact that the brain is a multi scale system that has functional um, consequences that span these different scales. They go all the way from molecules all the way up to the central nervous system of the whole system, but also it extends out into. People. Other people will affect your brain. I'm affecting yours right now. Sorry. <laughs> um, and we tend to not really take all this, this complexity in mind when we're looking at different types. And that leads to a bit of a challenge in terms of how we think about thinking these scales. That it's not simply the fact that you stack things one on top of the other. And by stacking that, you actually build this nice Lego thing that looks like a brain for a person. It's a, it's a, it's a very um, rich and necessarily complex system that has a number of ways that it can, it can navigate its environment. Its environment talking about both, both the person and the, and the brain and the person in the context of the rest of the, the, rest of the system. Um, Eve Martyr, and I forgot uh, Goyard's first name. Um, Omar. Omar. Omar Goyard, a, a fantastic paper in Nature of Universe, I think it's actually open access, it's worthwhile looking at. It really talks about sort of the cautionary um, tales about trying to make a, a, a too strong a statement about how you go between different scales. It's indeterminacy in terms of how you combine elements at one scale to go to the next one. That's good. That's actually part of how the architecture is set up. But it is something to be mindful of as you try and think about how you go from um, cells to circuits to systems to people. How those interactions manifest. It's a good thing, but it's also a very challenging thing. Um, so yeah, so dynamic networks extend way beyond the brain. Um, there was a paper that came up recently. It's actually a preprint with Med Archives, um, just showing all the dependencies between the body systems longitudinally and the different changes in the body systems that predict changes in other parts of the body systems. So fantastic paper, enormous amount of work, but it does reinforce the fact that the brain doesn't work in isolation. I say that and you say that's, that's a stupid thing to say because obviously it's true. But when you see it like that, in these kind of diagrams, you go, oh shit, I drink too much. <laughs> so if I don't sleep enough, or if I have to leave the kitchen, then my brain's gonna suffer as well. And now you have a number you can put to it, it's 0.52. So, and then a part of social network, and this, we don't think about social networks as being influential, but we don't have direct connections, but we do, right? We're talking to one another, it's a connection. And those things influence how we interact. And those interactions inter influence how our bodies, how our brains work. And those are, those are the networks that they can be evaluated. They can be evaluated using exactly the same methods that we use to evaluate um, the brain. So we're taking into consideration. Um, to end with this, um, now we could probably change the title to a looser concept of connectivity with the brain part out because it is one of these ideas that it's, it can be very elusive and nebulous. Um, and it's just, it's, it's important to keep in mind that we haven't really finalized how these things are defined. A lot of work to be done still. It's very important when you're having new conversations, when you're hearing the talks you're going to hear over the next day and a half, really get to the core. What do you mean by connectivity? What do you mean by dependency? What do you mean by these are networks? Tell me what you mean by that. Because the, the definitions might be quite different for different individuals. And that is the essence of how we communicate with the human brain, but also the essence of actually improving the science so we can make progress together. Um, it's hungry. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
let's take a couple, three questions, and then um, I'll let you go for lunch. Uh, thank you so much for a wonderful talk, Randy. One thing I'm curious about, like, I know that whenever we're working with a model, especially since it's such a degree kind of graph chain, but now there's often some research degrees of freedom that go in at the initial stage, decisions that have to be made about initial parameters to be set for the model. And I'm just curious, um, I, I think this maybe gets a little bit at kind of the behind the curtain idea. Um, how long would you recommend would be the best way of going about kind of what approach should be as cognitive neuroscientists who maybe don't have like a really deep solid foundation in graph theory and whatnot? How should we go about kind of preparing ourselves to um, use the virtual brain um, in a way that we can at least at, a, at some more surface level understand what's going on between the different sheets and differences between different models and whatnot? Sure. Um, I mean, the, the answer to the question, not just for virtual brain, for any kind of modeling effort, is to uh, try different approaches to getting to the same endpoint and see if you're, if you're successful in doing so. In virtual brain, um, one way to do that is changing, for example, the random COV conditions for how the estimation goes. And if you keep on converging to roughly the same point in parameter space, that tells you you're pretty close to having a reasonable identifiable model. Um, in, in graph theory, um, it's important to know what went into making the decisions about how er which areas are connected. Um, so there's binary um, adjacency matrices that are used. There's also uh, continuous adjacency matrices that are used. And each of those come up with slightly different answers. But there, um, you can just compare what you get from, from the outcome. Um, a very poignant example is for those of you who do fMRI and resting state fMRI, do you do global signal regression or not? Part of your pre-processing step. So, and I know if we had there were more people on this side of the room, if we asked that question, we'd have 50% saying yes, percent saying no. Um, and the answer to the question really is number one, take a look at your regressor and see if it's different across individuals. And number two, see how it changes. If it does change, that tells you something fundamental about the nature of the dependency between the global signal fluctuations and the functional connections. So it's 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 being Comfortable with, with looking, you can be peeking under the curtain, your, your, your entire body. <laughs> Thanks so much, Randy. And by the way, did I say already how great it is to have you in Vancouver after 25 years <laughs> in Toronto? Um, I have a question about um, some of the anatomical constraints, and I was wondering if, if that's already part of the virtual brain. Um, or if you're thinking about including it and also what you've seen in the literature in terms of um, the, one of the key words now is functional gradients. Uh, it's coming from the functional connectivity of yeah. the bodies, uh, but the basis of it is anatomical actually. And so there is a structural model, Helen Barbas has come up with it based on taking into account the anatomical constraints that come from the differently structured cortical regions. And so it strikes me that you, know, you ended on difficulty of uh, comparing functional and effective connectivity, but there's also huge difficulty in comparing structural and functional connectivity. And I wonder to what extent you think that some of these uh, gradients slash different uh, columnar organization of the cortex could help constrain and inform the uh, correspondence between structure and functional connectivity. Sure. Um, so, uh... Victor was mentioning some of the models that they're working on now. They're including a lot more information and getting to much more, more detailed granularity in terms of the structure. Um, we haven't quite got to the point yet where we're able to incorporate heterogeneity to the level that Helen's talking about, Barbara, in terms of the, um, like the different cortical layers, the layer, layer dependencies, the architecture itself. But we're getting there. Um, and it often becomes a case is how much does that actually inform the usefulness of the model? You can obviously come up with a model where you try and include every detail of what's happening in a model that's reality, um, which would be hard to actually solve. That's why it will be really interesting to see empirically how much uh, benefit it gives you 
because in terms of the functional networks, it, there seems to be a pretty close mapping between the networks that come out activated, default, sensory motor, uh, and the different organized, the different layer organization. Yeah. Um, Effectively, we're seeing actually these layers when we look at the functional yeah. networks. I, I, I will let Victor read China in a second. Keep away from the lectern. The microphone is uh, kicking out for people on Zoom. Oh. Is what? Is uh, kicking out for people on Zoom. You keep kind of going in close. Come, come closer to me. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, uh, so there is definitely an improvement in the model. Um, you have it at a certain spatial scale, it can include more information on the anatomy and also include more information on the individual aspect. Um, and that's an important differentiator. The human side, we don't, we're not quite at our level yet. And the mouse, we know that that's, that's likely true. Um, and the more details you put in, the better the model. There's going to be some optimality that you're going to reach in which you can add more information that doesn't help, but it depends on what you're, you're trying to model. Um, and that's always going to be a trade off between the details you're putting in the model, the model utility, and um, really going over the edge in terms of the amount of blood information trying to incorporate because the model may not be identifiable. It's going to be too many parameters to really be able to solve it. Um, so that's a He answered very well. There are many things that have not been said. For instance, functional connectivity. Uh, are you aware that functional connectivity or the connector is actually time delay dependent? It's a matter of con uh, communication, functional connectivity. Uh, Sam was talking about that uh, coherence. Yeah? So, um, uh, co uh, co uh, coherence depends on time delays. Time delays depend on distance. You can switch activity from synchronization to anti-synchronization. You can actually rewire the connectome by uh, putting in, uh, rewire the connectome, what you get as functional connectivity in quotation marks, yeah? by uh, changing at the frequency range. In uh, hemodynamics doesn't matter, but in electroencephalographic signals, you can actually, when you go from alpha through beta to gamma, you can get completely different results. So it becomes dependent on the frequency and that depends on the distance of uh, the track length, et cetera. So you have to actually take a renormalized connectome into account. Yeah? And that 95% uh, of all the researchers are not aware of this. Yeah? And uh, hence, uh, there are many uh, studies that need to be completely reinterpreted from this perspective. So there, what I'm trying to point out from this perspective is uh, that there is a whole bulk of uh, knowledge that Randy very nicely uh, presented. And we talked uh, uh, about this, but uh, as soon as you look in some technical details and the time delay is just one very simple example, everything starts disintegrating and it becomes non-translatable either for the individual or for the uh, disease. So, you have to be extremely specific with the questions. And yes, you need to look behind the curtain. That's <laughs> Not necessarily into the dynamic uh, mathematics, but know what you're doing. Any other burning questions? Susan Fitzpatrick had a really good comment. I just want to leave it up there for you. Um, stop the headless, uh, headless hedging. Probably a good term we should end the session on. <laughs> so we'll stop here. Um,